Um, hi guys, my name is Jen. Um, some of you I know very well, but many of you here I probably don't know at all. Um, maybe we've passed each other in the halls before, but hi. For the people that know me well and the ones that don't, my hope is that by the end of my time up here, you will know a little bit about me in a real way. I know we must share some of the same questions that have swirled around in our minds. What is it, what is it really that we desire most? What is true about our most treasured relationships? What is the nature of love? By the end of me standing up here, I hope that you and I share a tiny moment of human connection, even though we have, may have never met before, or even if we have. These talks are often filled with lots of helpful tidbits of wisdom, like be kind, take risks, follow your passion, etc. But I always find these difficult to latch on to. Like, yeah, cool, but it's usually not that simple. Instead, I'd like to just invite you into my life. But first, let me take off my mask. Our masks, it's that thing we wear on the outside, that strong exterior, the persona that has it all together. We now live in a social media world that gives us the power to craft our own personal images. We show the world only the little pockets of our happy moments, string them together, and reveal them as our reality. The pictures of hashtag candid laughs, the beautiful sights we got to see, the moments where we felt on top of the world, these are all perfectly captured moments, and I do it too. And while we should celebrate them, it's easy to forget that we see only the highlight reels of other people's lives. It is often a distorted representation of what's really happening in our lives, a mask that covers up all of the other moments, the painful ones, the difficult ones, and even the merely ordinary moments. And yet it's these other moments that I believe are just as precious. These other moments are often the ones that show us what we care about, what our hearts beat for, and what connects us to each other. So do we connect to masks? I think it is human to desire connection. We weren't made to be marveled at, to be adored, to impress. We were made to be in relationship with each other, to share deep, intimate connection with each other. I think this brings us a deep sense of joy. So I came to college from a super preppy small boarding school where I started this four-year journey chasing this idea of who I wanted to be. This carefree, effortless, strong, independent woman who is poised, intelligent, vibrant, perfect, worthy of envy. I didn't realize that when I wear a mask, only my mask receives love. So do we connect to masks? I think the answer is no. Our masks hurt us because we can neither love nor be loved from behind them. They hurt our ability to connect deeply with one another, leaving us isolated and far from each other. So I'm taking mine off with you. If you've ever kept a diary or a journal as a little kid and gone back to read all of the thoughts swirling around your little minds at the time, it's quite illuminating and usually quite hilarious as well. My best friend Denise and I have this tradition. Every Sunday for the past four years, Denise and I send Sunday letters to each other. Every Sunday night without fail, I have a long email in my inbox waiting for me, filled with all of her thoughts from the week, and I do the same for her. We have never missed a Sunday since 2013, um, so it's been four years. I'm going to share five passages from our emails over the years. Sometimes I think the past speaks for itself in ways that my own hindsight today cannot. So instead of being a random stranger up here telling you all of these life lessons that I've learned in college, I'd rather just invite you into a little piece of my life. There are so many things beyond the highlight reel of my life, and I'd like to share them with you. So here's passage number one from Sunday Letter 87, March 9th, 2015, my sophomore year. Quote, I've been thinking about whether or not to include something in this email. I've wanted to tell you something for a long time now, but it's one that I've hidden away for so long. It's a part of myself that I don't even understand. D, for the past few years, I've been really struggling with an eating disorder. It was always something I felt like my best friend should know. I wanted there to be no barriers between us. I'm really not a perfect human being. I'm broken, I'm empty, 
lost and trying to find the right path to. So with my mask off, here's something few people know about me. I struggled in my college years with an eating disorder, and it's been one of the hardest battles and one of the greatest blessings in my entire life, which is hard to believe. Um, when everything was spiraling out from under my feet, I loved the feeling of control I thought I had. I loved the false sense of power that it gave me. But fleeting moments of peace and power for, were followed by guilt and shame. It's the moment I began to believe it was part of who I was becoming that I got to know what shame was. My failed attempts to be done with it reinforced this idea that this was me. This is what shame is. I wrote in my journal, amidst the thick of it, I'm wandering and searching and completely lost and empty again. What is happening to me? Why can't I fight it? I've always been searching and searching for something, trying to prove something, trying to make myself worthy. Sophomore year Jen nailed it on the head. This perfect person that I was trying to chase as part of my image, um, it's who I wanted to be, but it wasn't who I really was. And I was struggling hard. And if you saw me on campus, you probably never would have guessed. Passage number two. This is from a Sunday letter I wrote to Denise on October 6th, 2016. And this is Sunday letter number 174. Quote, I think I've had a wrong perception of what being strong means, a perception which has slowly began to change through all of this. Perhaps strength doesn't mean having it all together all the time. Perhaps strength isn't being objective and logical all the time, not letting emotions show. Perhaps real strength is letting yourself be vulnerable, be real, and to be unafraid. Let me tell you about someone who absolutely captured my attention one day. I think it's hard to know strength and beauty and vulnerability until we see it. But when we do, I think it really sticks with us. There's something in it that draws us in. I'd like to tell you about a woman named Leah. For years, I knew Leah as the woman a few years older than me with short blonde hair and a bubbly aura who's always smiling and bopping around at church with her energy. I only knew her casually for about a year or two. A few highs exchanged on Sunday mornings and got coffee with her maybe once. The one thing I always remembered about her most was her joy. About a year ago, my friends went to our church's women's retreat. I stayed back and decided not to go. When they got home that weekend, they described how raw and open she was able to be with the girls there about fighting battles. It struck so close to home with me because she faced the same battles that I did. For the next two days, I was in awe of someone I barely knew. She was someone that I felt I had this quiet sense of connection to, a deep sense of relief that said, oh my goodness, you aren't alone. Someone gets it too. One of the most beautiful things we can ever hear from someone is, me too. I wanted what Leah had. I wanted the beautiful openness she carried that cast out the same guilt and shame that I carried. I remember thinking, how the heck can she be so open? How the heck did she get there? So I reached out, and I got coffee with her. And I was so nervous. We ended up talking for hours at a coffee shop in Greenfield. We sat on her porch as the sun set that day, and she said we'd walk through it together. This was about exactly a year ago, and that was the first of a ton more coffee dates and time spent with this woman who would teach me so much. Every time I look at Leah, I see living proof of the insane beauty that emanates from strength in a place of total vulnerability. Sometimes I think we need to see someone displaying the hope we often fail to believe that we have. And as we step out into the light, unafraid and unashamed, we begin to become that person to someone else, someone we may not even know is desperately needing it the most. Struggle is a beautiful thing because it's common in the human experience. So why do we shy away from our scars, from our struggles, and from the messiest parts of us? A good friend taught me that it's our scars that are evidence of a story, and it's our stories that reach people. Leah's story met me right where I was at and changed my reality. And I believe that our own stories have the power to do the same. I could end my story here, 
We often tell stories following the same pattern. Struggle, fight, redemption, and then the story ends. The movies do this too. But our lives and our reality don't work that way. There is so much more of an ebb and flow between struggle and redemption, struggle and redemption. And thank God they are this way because again and again we are being challenged and stretched. And this is precisely how we grow. I want to talk about the obstacles we face. If we have this desire for openness with each other in our most treasured relationships, then what fights to pull us in the opposite direction? What are we up against? What are our fears? Why do we have walls? What is it that keeps us from greater and deeper connection to each other? Here are two, apathy and the fear of rejection. So I believe that apathy is rooted in the fear of pain, the fear of hurt. It is easier to disconnect than to take the risk. So this is passage number three. I wrote this in an email to Denise after the end of a relationship that I cared a lot about. I hope this is a little peek into all the ways that I still fight to let myself feel. November 6, 2016, Sunday Letter 174. D, it's so hard sorting out my emotions right now. I hate them. I hate the way they make you irrational. I hate how much influence they have. I wish I didn't sweep how I felt under the rug for so long. As much as I want to be all strong and happy and over it, maybe it's okay that I'm not. It's still all too confusing and complicated and I want to throw up my hands and numb myself to it all. But I'm realizing that emotions can be a beautiful thing. Without the risk of pain, we can't love. Without the risk of hurt, we can't care for someone deeply. So for you and for me, I hope we don't let our hearts grow cold and afraid. I hope we let them beat fervently and passionately. We can't numb the pain without numbing ourselves to love and joy as well. And we have to be real with ourselves first before we can be real with other people. The second and probably the biggest competition for our desire for genuine relationship is our fear of rejection. It's the little thought in our heads that keeps saying over and over and over again, I can't, I can't, because what if they see me differently? What if it changes things? This past October, I wrote a letter to my parents telling them everything. Um, this is passage number four from Sunday Letter 173, October 30th, 2016. I'm relieved and hopeful after sending this letter to them. D, I knew it was right. I felt it in my gut. I was nervous, so nervous after I pressed send. I didn't want them to feel deceived. I didn't tell them about struggling with this eating disorder. I didn't want them to feel like I hid it from them for all this time. Part of me is still really nervous about that. But there's another part of me that's just so relieved that they now know. By keeping this big thing from them and hiding so much of who I am behind trying to be this perfect daughter, I was limiting how close I let them come. Walls stood between us, ones that they didn't even know about because I built them. I'm starting to realize more and more that so much of loving another person and letting yourself be loved by another person is dependent on how much of yourself you want to show them, how far into your heart you're willing to let them in. Sometimes we fear that the people closest to us will see us differently if we give them all of us. But what if we are giving the people in our lives the opportunity to love us more deeply when we let them in? What if we are in fact giving them the gift of our deep trust? So what's waiting on the other side of our fears? On the other side of our fears, there's so much waiting. I think that unconditional love is on the other side of our fears because there is no fear in love. This last passage, passage number five, um, is from Sunday Letter 189. This is February 19th, 2017, only about a month ago. I wrote this to Denise when she was having a hard week. D, I hope you know that I love you not for how good or how great you are and no weakness, flaw, or struggle will ever drive me away. Love, the real kind, the unconditional kind of love, is ushered in the precise moment that someone knows the weakest, ugliest, most raw parts about you, and they say, yeah, I love you more because of that, and that changes absolutely nothing. No matter what happens, whenever you are lost and cannot find your way, you have to remember this. There is someone in this world whose life you changed when you came into it, 
There's someone in this world you are worth everything to. There's someone in this world who believes in you in the moments that you can't believe in yourself. There's someone in this world fighting with you against every dragon that is coming our way. And there's someone in this world who treasures you because they believe that you are worth it. I will fight by your side till we see the sun come up again. And guess what we're going to do? We're going to sit on top of that mountain with the wind in our hair. We're going to watch that sun rise again and we're going to look at each other and think, dang, that was a good fight and we got through it together. So for you and for me, may we fight the good fight to love the messiest, ugliest, most raw parts of ourselves and the messiest and ugliest, most raw parts of the people placed in our lives. One of my favorite quotes is by Timothy Keller. He said, to be loved and not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. So what is it then that we desire most? I think we desire to be fully known and fully loved. Taking off our mask pushes us to be fully known. Unconditional love pours in when we are fully loved. Thus, we are fully known in our messes and fully loved despite our messes. This is unconditional love. This type of love possesses, possesses a unique power. It always overflows within us. When we are loved unconditionally, it fills us up in a way where it fully pours out of us and we can't help but want to share it. People are continuing to struggle silently. And we, you and I, possess the power to give people the opportunity to live unashamed by the way that we lead our lives. Vulnerability always breeds vulnerability. And vulnerability is always the right choice because it is so easy to be cold in a world that makes it so difficult to remain soft. So if a culture of vulnerability, vast and unconditional love is what we choose and hope for, we need to be that one kid at the middle school dance who's getting in the middle of the circle, dancing like a goon, so that everyone else can begin to join in. How much will we embrace our willingness to be real? And how much more is at stake? We can be a world that not, is not a museum for saints or a runway show of perfect personalities. Our stories are evidence of our humanity, so we should tell them. If it's our masks that isolate us from each other, then let's take them off and let them fall to the ground. Let us be raw and open with each other in ways that terrify us deeply. We may be a lot less sparkly, but a lot more real. And there's nothing more beautiful than that anyway. Thank you.